for decades, we have constantly been bombarded with the message that inflation is low. It has only been in the recent few months that inflation numbers have risen to a level to cause some concern in first world countries such as the US and France. But is it too late? For decades, the low inflation story has allowed governments around the world to undertake extreme monetary policies like modern monetary theory. After all, because inflation continues to remain low, we can continue to afford the same goods and services, can't we? Yet, at the same time, we are experiencing stagnant wage growth, which means that average wage earners can no longer even afford houses in their cities, combined with the largest wealth inequality between the rich and poor that we've ever seen. In this video, we'll examine why an over-reliance on the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, as a measure of inflation, may potentially be the reason why we are facing some of the worst problems in the financial system in history. Find out why the way we and our governments think about inflation is failing us. This video is brought to you by I Dream of Money. The channel brings you videos about business, economics and money. Help us reach 1,000 subscribers by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons so you never miss out on a video to help you become a better investor. Part 1 the role of inflation and CPI in economics. So if you're new to economics, here is a quick summary of the concept of inflation. It is essentially a measure of the change of prices in an economy in a defined period. When inflation is too high, this means that prices are going up and people's purchasing power reduces, which can lead to fear in the market and lower demand for goods and services. On the flip side, if deflation occurs, this means that prices are going down and people may end up postponing spending in anticipation of even lower prices. Neither is desirable, and most reserve banks around the world base their monetary policy to achieve a target annualized CPI of 2%. As to them, this reflects a low rate of inflation to maximize economic growth and employment. But have you ever stopped to think why CPI is considered a proxy for inflation? If you haven't, then maybe it's time you did. Because let's face it, the CPI has now become such an important economic measure that it literally impacts every facet of our lives. As mentioned earlier, reserve banks aim for a target CPI, impacting the interest rate and therefore the cost of borrowing and the flow of money into the economy. Public service wages grow by CPI and to a certain extent private sector wages as well. Social security and Medicare payments are often pegged to CPI. The CPI also impacts investment decisions, both at the government and private level. Because it is a measure that is synonymous with inflation, it is used in financial modelling to determine the value of assets, as well as to adjust countries' gross domestic product or GDP from the nominal to the real rate. This then leads to changes in economic growth and importantly jobs. So again, I ask, why do so many critical decisions impacting our lives effectively rely on this one measure? What makes the CPI so special that it is able to do all of this heavy lifting for the economy? Part 2. The History of the CPI According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, or the BLS, which is the department responsible for producing CPI data for the US, the CPI, or at least some version of it, has been used for over 100 years now. It's important to understand the history of the CPI because it highlights that the CPI is not some unbiased measure of the cost of living. The CPI has been used to further political and other special interests since the time it was established. The BLS itself openly acknowledges this. They state in this article, the continuing theme that runs through this article is the notion that challenges presented by specific historical events often compel changes to the methodology that underlies the CPI. In other words, the answers to questions concerning why the Bureau uses a particular index formula or defines particular concepts as it does are rarely simply a matter of technical precision. Rather, they are frequently a matter of identifying some event that creates a need for a specific kind of price index and analysing the often competing demands that different users place on that index. The BLS first collected cost of living data in order to examine the impact of the government's new tariff policy. This data was subsequently used to mediate labour disputes and to help standardise and stabilise wages after World War I, only to then be used in World War II to cap wage increases as a means of controlling inflation. Post-war, private enterprises such as General Motors urged the BLS to continue to produce the CPI data to help set wage increases in labour contracts to avoid costly labour strikes. 
Slowly, the role of CPI data expanded to become an international measure of inflation. The CPI is now used to adjust income eligibility levels for government assistance, federal tax brackets, federally mandated cost of living increases, private sector wage and salary increases, and consumer and commercial rent escalations. Part 3. How is the CPI calculated? Greetings, it is I, DeCount. When the CPI was first developed, and up until the late 1950s, it used the constant goods framework for constructing the price index. This meant that the CPI was calculating the same market basket of goods and services over a specified period. The BLS incrementally discarded the constant goods framework for the alternative constant utility conception of price index theory. The defining moment that caused this change was the commissioning in 1959 of the Price Statistics Review Committee, commonly known as the Stigler Committee. This approach meant moving away from the idea that the CPI measured the change in the cost of consuming a fixed set of goods and services over time, usually between 10 and 15 years, and adopting the idea that the CPI should measure the change in the cost of maintaining a constant utility by adjusting for consumer preferences and spending behavior through time as relative prices changed. The BLS was initially resistant to making this change, arguing that this new methodology was in effect not only measuring changes in prices, but also changes in quantity, asking what exactly would be achieved by this index. Was it an index of price changes or an index of quantity changes? Had the index become so complex that its true meaning couldn't clearly be understood anymore? However, the BLS eventually followed the Stigler Committee recommendations, undertaking a major change to its CPI methodology in 1978. What goods and services does the CPI cover? The CPI represents all goods and services purchased for consumption by the reference population, U being urban population or W being clerical workers. BLS has classified all expenditure items into more than 200 categories arranged into eight major groups. Food and beverages, housing, apparel, transportation, medical care, recreation, education and communication and other goods and services. In addition, the CPI includes taxes such as sales and excise taxes that are directly associated with the prices of specific goods and services. However, the CPI excludes taxes such as income and social security taxes not directly associated with the purchase of consumer goods and services. The CPI also does not include investment items such as stocks, bonds, real estate and life insurance because these items relate to savings and not to day-to-day -day consumption expenses. You then go into the handbook of methods that the BLS uses to actually calculate CPI and you realize how many assumptions and adjustments go into the calculation with some funky equations to boot. Some of these adjustments include item replacement and quality adjustments, something referred to as imputation, which is a procedure for handling missing information, an estimation of price change for shelter, which includes both rent and for owners of property, includes what's called an owner's equivalent rent of primary residence, or OER index measure, which effectively assumes a rent that owners should be charged, special pricing for seasonal items and other discounts and refunds. The CPI calculation is now unrecognizable from its beginnings. Part 4. Problems with the CPI I think it should be apparent now that the methodology used to calculate CPI is incredibly complex, and so complex that it's unclear how this calculation is meant to inform governments about how to manage an economy. First, the CPI suffers what's known in statistics as the flaw of averages. It's when you average copious amounts of data and become obsessed with the final single number that pops out. The problem is that this average number is a number that ends up being relevant to nobody at all. The start of this Harvard Business Review article explains the issue neatly. Consider the case of a statistician who drowns while fording a river that he calculates is on average three feet deep. If he were alive to tell the tale, he would expound on the flaw of averages, which states simply that plans based on assumptions about average conditions usually go wrong. This basic but almost always unseen flaw shows up everywhere in business, distorting accounts, undermining forecasts, and dooming apparently well-considered projects to disappointing results. In summary, by relying on averages, we become blind to the risks of the situation we're in. This is exactly what is happening around the world. By relying on an average CPI measure to examine the risk of inflation on the economy, government officials miss the warning signs in specific sectors. 
One key example is the housing market, which governments around the world have allowed to run rampant, even though overall inflation is technically low. Another problem with the CPI is that it only measures spending on consumption. However, people don't just spend their money on consumption, people also save and invest. You've probably heard the saying, what isn't measured isn't managed. Hence why asset prices are inflating like crazy, yet incomes often linked to CPI are not keeping up because CPI simply doesn't measure the price of investments. The implications of CPI inaccurately reflecting inflation and the cost of living are huge. Martin Hochstein, a senior economist and member of Allianz Global, has published a number of thought pieces where he believes the CPI actually understates inflation. He believes that this has far-reaching consequences, not only for consumers themselves, but for the broader economy, monetary policy, fiscal policy and financial markets. First, real GDP and productivity growth figures could actually be too high. This is because nominal or the headline GDP figures must be adjusted down by inflation to calculate real GDP. The lower the CPI rate, the higher real GDP is. Secondly, public spending could be suppressed. Social security and other spending measures indexed to inflation would be too low if true inflation were higher than what the official numbers reported. Thirdly, central banks could be inclined to implement highly accommodative policy measures if they were misled by supposedly undershooting their inflation target. Part 5. Takeaways for Investors If you are currently thinking, well, what can I, an investor sitting at home, do with this information? It's just this. Simply recognise that CPI is not an accurate measure of asset inflation, which is typically what investors are interested in. For example, just because an investment is advertised as being linked to inflation doesn't mean it is keeping up with the inflation of asset prices if the only measure it is being linked to is CPI. Read any investment document carefully to understand exactly how returns are calculated and don't fall into the CPI equals inflation trap. The second takeaway is that if you need to measure inflation in a financial model, don't just limit yourself to using CPI as the benchmark. Use the most appropriate and specific measure of inflation you can find in relation to the asset class and industry that you're looking at in order to give you a more accurate result and to help you make better decisions. Hochstein also suggests in his article that investors should consider increasing the allocation to real assets as an inflation hedge and diversifier such as equities, real estate and commodities and steering away from monetary assets like bonds in order to prevent stealth devaluation by unmeasured inflation. Finally, the best thing you can do for your investing journey is to continue to educate yourself. Realize that mainstream financial concepts are not infallible and that you should continue to question the world and always keep an open mind. The real question is, will governments be motivated to change the current system when relying on a CPI that understates inflation actually suits them, given it allows them to meet their inflation, GDP and productivity growth targets? The truth is, keeping CPI low also helps keep costs under control for governments. Governments can pay lower wages to public servants, they can make out smaller unemployment checks, and they can borrow cheaply to fund programs. Also, the fact of the matter is, asset bubbles keep many voters happy, particularly those who already have assets and who are also generally older and wealthier. Will there be enough political imperative to change a system that makes people feel rich, even though it comes at the expense of the less well-off, no longer being able to afford assets anymore, in particular homes? Let me know in the comments below what other topics you'd be interested in me examining in further detail. If you like this video, please help us reach 1000 subscribers by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons. Thanks for watching and until next time.